Hello everyone, this is Manas, your friend and tutor. And guys, in today's session, we are going to talk about average normal stress. You must have come across this, this ratio very often. If you are a mechanical engineering student or even a civil engineering student, you must have come across this ratio. And what you guys generally tend to write over here is that ratio of P over A is simply sigma. Well, that's not completely true. What's true is this, that P by A is actually equal to the averaged value of normal stress over a cross section over a cross section let's say this right and i'll prove it to you why this is the average value over a cross section so let's see for that what we are going to do is that we are going to pick up a material and this over here guys is a cylindrical rod which is let's say having length l and this is having a cross section a one more thing which needs to be kept in mind that the material is homogeneous and isotropic i mean in each and every chapter on mechanics of solids you will see these two assumptions very very important homogeneous means that the mechanical properties and physical properties are same throughout the entire volume and at the same time this isotropic means that the mechanical properties along x y and z directions are same that means young's modulus along x along y and along z will remain one and same let's try to analyze this what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to cut this cut this with respect to let's say a plane okay and when i do that i'll have a cross section over here something like this now guys let's try to analyze this cross section what's happening inside and if you watch carefully this cylindrical uh, rod by the way is acted upon by external loads isn't it these are external loads let me make it over here let me do that quickly so it's something like this yeah done done so there is an external load happening over here acting external load the name well we know that very well it's p external load is p now, obviously, if there is going to be load, some kind of resistance will develop. Let's say that the total resistance developed across this cross section A is equal to P. Right now, guys, this is the external load or external force. This over here rather is the internal force or load, whatever you may call it. Or you can also say that this is the internal resistance offered. And by the way, or rather by the definition, the internal resistance offered per unit area is what is known as stress and today I'll prove it to you that internal resistance per unit area is equal to is actually equal to the averaged value of normal stress so we'll see that all in detail so this is all about the internal resistance offered now guys take a look one more look at this here we go let me just draw this this is basically a timeline same stuff same stuff and if you watch here, let's pick up a very small element. Okay, let me draw that element over here in 3D of a slightly bigger size, like this. Okay, in the 3D form. Now, as you can clearly see, this load is actually acting in the Z direction. So, this over here is the Z axis. Over here, we'll having the y axis. Here, we have the x axis. So on like that. Okay. So this element is going to automatically develop a stress in the z direction. It's quite obvious, right? Now let us try to divide this entire cross section into very small, small elements, and let us try to work out the force acting individually on those small aerial elements. Let us try to do that. Okay so here we go and by the way by the way let me draw a slightly bigger figure that would be appropriate where shall i draw that here only let's say okay this is slightly bigger you know and something like this so i have remade this slightly bigger version of this picture over here and what we'll try to do is we'll try to divide this entire area into extremely small parts like this like this 
okay and we will try to focus our attention on any one area in particular let's say this is one this is two this is three and you can clearly see that there are a lot of parts i mean if you just try to make a count four and four will be eight then nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen i have did i did roughly 18 parts of this cross section and we'll try to work out the magnitude of force acting on each and every part let's try to do that now these are all very small elements let us talk about this this one element in particular let me just highlight this okay let me try to make this element over here and then let us try to analyze now where shall i make it let's say here element one so that's element one for you okay element one done so if you watch carefully obviously they this area will also will also provide some resistance in the upper direction let's say this direction is corresponding to delta f z and this delta f z will be a product of stress z z where only for this small area 1 multiplied by delta a only for this small area 1 right now guys in the same manner you can represent this area 2 also area 2 can be written as this is by the way delta f, f z and let me just write over here 1 the total resistance offered is by the way that is p similarly what we can write is delta f z 2 is equal to sigma z z 2 and this is going to be delta a into 2 you can go ahead and ahead you can go ahead and finally for the nth element you can write it as delta f z delta f z n is equal to sigma z z n dot delta a and this is going to be n now guys this is the total total internal resistance offered which by the way is equal to internal resistance offered from 1 that is this plus internal resistance offered from 2 that is this and so on and so forth so what we can basically do is we can express this p which is equal to delta f1 rather i should say delta fz1 plus delta fz2 and this goes on and on until you reach delta fz n what you really need to do now is to put up the values of all of these all of these over here and let's see what happens okay something very interesting is going to happen just by doing this these these much part is not enough we need to we need to make more parts we need to make more divisions just watch Now guys, let's say, let's say I do more partitions instead of, instead of, let's say I do more partitions, very close, very close. I do more partitions. I increase the number of partitions. What would happen like this? If I increase the number of partitions, what will happen? If I keep on increasing the number of partitions, let's say that the number of partitions tends to infinity. In that case, all these areas would become very, very small. Okay, they'll converge to a point. In that case, you can say that delta A will tend to zero. And this is something which I'll use right now. This is going to be very, very useful. So watch, here we go. And let me just remove this. So what we are basically doing is, we are dividing this entire cross section into very small, small linear elements. What we're trying to say is, initially there were n elements. Let's say that n tends to infinity. There are infinite, infinite aerial elements. In that case, each and every area element will have an area equal to zero not equal to zero but it will tend to zero right so in that case what i can do is i can express this p is equal to summation of just watch this this is going to be very very interesting sigma z z i multiplied by delta a into i and here i is equal to 1 to n and the limit limit is for that this n over here not capital N should rather write it as small n n tends to infinity remember this this also is not capital N I have written small n over here so let me put small n 
n tends to infinity and this summation can be now be replaced for the entire for all the elements have been covered up so this summation can be replaced by this integral sign so you have it now sigma z z and this delta will become d differentiate so here we have the internal the net resisting force over here is actually equal to what integral of normal stress over the entire area times da but that is not enough we want to reach this final expression we have to prove that the ratio of p to a is actually the averaged value of the normal stress spread over the entire area how can that be done that appears to be a bit confusing so what i need to do is i need to well i need to make some space okay okay one more thing which i forgot to tell you remember we are studying mechanics of solids and here everything every load that we apply is below the proportional limit which essentially means whenever you apply a load then the resistance offered at any cross section is going to be equal to the external applied load if you are offering a load of if you are applying a load of p in that case the resistance offered will automatically be equal to p but this will only be true as long as as long as the load applied is below the proportional limit as long as there is a linear relationship between stress and strain okay as long as hooke's law is followed no problem whatsoever now i'm going to rub all of this okay let's proceed now something very interesting is about to happen now okay that was all the analysis so okay so what we basically done till now we worked out forces acting on these small areal elements in the form of these products okay so here the stress component is how much sigma zz1 and the area is delta a1 here the stress component is sigma zz2 and the areal component is delta a2 in in this manner we have we have basically covered all the elements okay and finally we have an expression of something of this sort now in calculus we actually come across functions which are continuous and this over here the stress is also a continuous function and let me tell you how okay so what we do have over here is a continuous function in the form of stress so watch this when the area is delta a1 we get a particular value of stress okay so this y axis is for stress and this over here this x axis rather this is for what this is for area let's say area the delta area i am talking about when the area is delta a2 that means this area this area then the stress value is different at each and every area for each and every value of x you get a different value of y or stress isn't it similarly you have delta a3 you have a different value and this keeps on going until you reach delta an and you have a different value of stress in this way you can say there is some kind of plot okay now let me let me this might sound a bit interesting this might sound a bit interesting this is the area of sigma and area area of sigma and area up here sounds a bit confusing but let me clarify everything in a very simplistic manner okay so you can clearly see here the value of uh, what sigma that we have got is sigma z z what 1 here the value of sigma that we have achieved is sigma z z 2 at each and every point at each and every area for every individual area you get a different value of sigma now this is going to be a big problem for us because we need one value of sigma for the entire cross section and that one value by the way is going to be the average value of all these different sigma z z3 sigma z z4 and so on that one value is going to be the average value of all these different stress components for individual areas and this is something which we'll try to do using a formula and this is going to be very interesting watch this sigma average we wish to calculate the average value of stress how can average value of stress be calculated using this formula this is something that we have learned read extensively in calculus and this is going to be equal to what okay so sigma zz dot ta over the width width 
of this x axis how much is the width the entire area is the width that's it okay let's call this as the equation number 1 right and if you watch carefully something very interesting is about to happen integral of sigma zz dot da sigma zz dot da okay is equal to what is equal to p so d this product can essentially be replaced by p and there you go you have it sigma average is p over a and that is why i was telling you all that p by a ratio is nothing but the average value of normal stress over this entire cross section and guys there is something else which i want all of you to read about and that is calculating the average value of a continuous function using calculus go ahead read that stuff and uh, once that is done you'll be able to understand this in a much more intuitive manner this is this is mathematics this is pure calculus okay once again you are getting different value of sigma for different value of areas and what we have basically done is converted all these different values into one single value that is the average value okay and this is what we have achieved and one more thing which i can tell you is this let me just draw it over here this is area and this over here is sigma and we've got as average value sigma average okay let's say it ends here what delta a n okay we started from somewhere from here where delta a1 and by calculus let's say this is area 1 and this over here is area 2 and by the way by the way this sigma average is such that when you multiply this sigma average with this over here with this over here this multiplication you get an area 2 and area 2 will actually work out as area 1 this is the benefit of having one single value that is sigma average this is pure math so guys that was all for today i'll see you again in the next video until then take care have a nice day keep learning and keep watching thanks